All right, it looks like everybody's back, I think. Uh, so let's continue. Just a little piece of news here. This was, um, and I want to relate it to today's class, obviously. I'm not just sort of interested in what's happening in the vending machines at University of Waterloo. Um, did anybody read this story? How many of you read CBC every morning when you wake up uh, on your phone? Well, I do, um, only because I don't know what else to do in the morning. So I, I look at the news. Uh, here's a sort of a comical story that came up. It, it's, it's funny, but not really funny at all. Um, so this concerns the University of Waterloo, having decided now to remove all of the vending machines on campus. Why did they remove all the vending machines on campus at Waterloo? Well, it turns out uh, that a student noticed, have you ever seen these error messages, by the way, on some of the vending machines in the UCC? I've seen these error messages pop up, which always makes me worry, like, why is there an error message on my vending machine? The vending machine should be, you put money in and you get pop or chips out. It's the simplest thing possible, right? But some of them are smart vending machines, so they occasionally throw an error code. And then looked up there, it says, ivenda.vending.facialrecognitionapp.exe application error. Turns out all of the vending machines at University of Waterloo have face recognition software that nobody knew about, including the people at University of Waterloo. Um, this then prompted somebody to say like, wait a minute, how is this right? Why are there little cameras all over? And why are they taking pictures of people buying uh, lift bars uh, through the vending machines? It turns out the company uh, is a company called, uh, let's see if we can find it here. They talked to the company who makes them. Uh, Ivenda is a company from Switzerland that makes all of these vending machines. So the companies, are, the vending machines aren't really local. The reason I bring this up is that most of us have a prior set of information about vending machines. Uh, do you expect them, first of all, to be operated by a company in Switzerland? How many would say yes? I would say not. <laughs> it's not something that ever occurred to me. How many of you would expect face recognition? Uh, probably not. So this is an example kind of like, I think, um, the uh, telemarketer example I gave in the past. So most of us, how many of you have purchased something from a vending machine on campus uh, at least sometime in the last few weeks or months? I never do because they only take a Western One card, most of them, and I don't have any money on my card. Uh, I only have, uh, I, they don't take Apple Pay, uh, so I'm not usually interested. Some of them do now. Uh, so if you've ever purchased something uh, on the vending machine, you don't normally expect your picture to be taken, right? Um, however, most companies, as I'm sure you know, uh, a lot of companies go out of their way to collect data from the users so that they can predict, they can make an inference, they can make a judgment about who is likely to buy stuff, what things are being purchased? What kind of condition or what kind of state is the person in when they're purchasing something from the vending machine? What time of day? Uh, how many different kinds of people? Is the same person coming back uh, to this vending machine and buying the same thing? Old style vending machines would not give you that information, right? They would let you know what's being purchased and when, but they wouldn't let you know uh, if it's the same person uh, and that that person also happens to be over here at a certain time. How many of you use, uh, so before I get to the next point, let me know, by the way, uh, the next time you walk past a vending machine, if it appears to be one that has a little tiny camera somewhere, uh, sending images to some data center in Switzerland uh, about who's purchasing cliff bars uh, in the middle of the night. Um, the second thing is how many of you use online, use a parking app to park on campus, to park downtown, uh, to park at various places. You sort of have to in many cases, right? Uh, and they are, have you probably noticed that every single parking lot seems to use a different app, right? So you got like six different parking apps on your phone. They're doing this, most of these companies do the same thing, right? They wanna know who parks where, uh, at what time, uh, what your license number is. It's very different from putting coins in a meter, right? Uh, so now, uh, Honk Mobile, uh, and the companies that partner with Honk Mobile can make inferences about your usership, uh, about where you're going to be parking, what your habits are, the kinds of people who drive Hondas, uh, the kind of people who drive Mercedes, uh, where they're likely to park, how long they're likely to park, uh, and how often you're likely to um, request to have additional time put on the meter. Anyway, I found this a really interesting 
and kind of surprising story. I didn't expect this, uh, this really adjusts my expectations of vending machines. I thought of all the places on campus that would be the safest uh, from interacting with any other human being. I would think the vending machine would be that one chance, right? To not be judged when you buy a supersized chunky. Uh, the vending machine should be that chance to buy candy uh, without being judged. However, some company in Switzerland is judging you, uh, or at least they were until somebody found out uh, and posted about it online. So let's move on to let's move on to categorical induction. The example works, though. I think it is an example of what I expect. My expectations of vending machines and the company's expectations. They don't expect people to object. Uh, they don't expect people to even notice uh, that there's a camera. Let's talk about categorical induction. And let me make this big. Uh, let me make this small. And let's uh, pick up where we left off, that Hume uh, is going to identify a problem. Philosophically, uh, Goodman in, and Quine will uh, arrive at some solutions for the philosophical problem. And that will lead us to the discussion of categorical inference. So David Hume uh, is a philosopher from the 1700s, uh, part of the Scottish Enlightenment. And one of the things that Hume uh, is famous for, one of many things that he's famous for, uh, is criticizing the idea of induction. Uh, so he identified a problem with induction. Uh, and we're going to call these the negative and positive thesis. So one of the things Hume and other uh, Enlightenment era philosophers were most concerned about was uh, the idea of empiricism. Uh, so you probably, how many of you encountered the idea of empiricist philosophers uh, from the Enlightenment, right? And the idea, can somebody give me a quick definition of an empirical uh, standpoint? What's an empiricist believe from a philosophical standpoint? Anybody remember from first year philosophy or, yeah. The opposite of having innate. Perfect. Yes, it's sort of the opposite of having an innate idea. Uh, and philosophers uh, from an earlier time might have thought uh, or might have made arguments that certain things are innate. Even Plato, when we talked about uh, categories, was suggesting that there are natural boundaries. Our job is to learn them, but the boundaries are there. There are ideals that we're supposed to learn. Uh, there might be some suggestions that some of these tendencies are innate, but empiricists wanted to figure out how much we really need the idea of innate beliefs. Maybe we can understand human behavior by understanding uh, that we learn things from experience. And so the strong sort of the strongest view would be the blank slate hypothesis or the uh, idea which I think you probably uh, relate to John Locke, this idea of a being born with the mind as a blank slate, something that has nothing on it and you acquire everything through experience, which makes sense because we learn things from experience. So the question is how much innateness do you need? How much experience do you need? What's the interaction between these things? And Hume was concerned that if we're gonna just rely on experience, then we have a problem with induction because he correctly uh, surmised that induction is kind of the cornerstone to our life, right? We need induction to be able to take our experiences that we've garnered, which empiricists argue are, act, are important for us. Uh, and then we need to make predictions about what's gonna happen in the future. Makes sense, right? Problem with that is, he identified a problem. He calls this his negative thesis. I'll reword these in slightly different uh, language on the next slide, which you don't have a copy of because I think I just updated that one. Um, Hume's negative thesis, we cannot hold that nature will continue to be uniform because it has been in the past. At this, as this is using the very sort of reasoning induction that is under question, it would be circular reasoning. What he means there is, just because induction seemed to explain things in the past, just because there was a correspondence between uh, using your uh, beliefs and your memories to predict things in the past, 
just because the uniform, just because the universe worked in the past, doesn't mean that you expect it to work in the future, because that is also induction. Maybe another way to say it is, look, induction worked in the past. Uh, yesterday, I was able to use some specific observations, make a conclusion, uh, and make a decision based on that. I used induction yesterday, but just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's going to work tomorrow. Uh, the assumption that it is going to work tomorrow is an induction, and that's the circular reasoning. In other words, if induction has always worked and you expect it to always work, uh, that in and of itself is a form of inductive reasoning. So we can't use induction to explain induction. We became very worried about this. This is a problem for philosophers. If we can't explain how induction works without using induction, then we don't have a mechanism to do it. Uh, we're just saying, look, induction works. Uh, it always has, it always will. Uh, that's unsatisfactory. He calls this his negative thesis. His negative because he's, he's feeling negative about induction. Um, then he suggests a positive thesis. You know what? Nature, by absolute necessity, has determined us to judge as well as to breathe and feel. Uh, this is an maybe a seven, uh, you know, an 18th century way of saying we're hardwired for this, right? Uh, we've evolved through natural selection to make inductions because it's necessary for survival. That's his positive thesis. Negative thesis: induction can't work because it's circular reasoning. Positive thesis: Look, I don't care about any of that. The point is. We just have to have induction. There's no other way around it. And it must just be something that just like breathing, we've been designed to do. Hume's negative thesis, I feel negative <laughs> because induction cannot be explained without resorting to induction itself. And this is a major problem for philosophy. So those were Hume's words on the previous slide. This is my um, paraphrasing. And I apologize that you don't have this slide. Um, I just was looking through my slides this morning and. It occurred to me that Hume's language isn't always as clear as I'd like it to be, so I've just reworded this. If I can remember, if someone sends me a message, I'll update your own slides with this one too. Uh, I also rely on past experience, and I know from past experience that by the time I walk from here to my office in Werb, I will forget every promise that I've made about updating slides unless I have a reminder. So if you'd like me to update those slides, uh, please uh, send me a message that says, please update the slides. And I will do it, I promise, if I get the reminder. But I don't want 150 reminders. Could someone, one person, just agree amongst yourselves to remind me to do this? Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'll, there'll be so many that I'll lose track of what's happening. Uh, so that's Hume's negative thesis. He's feeling negative about induction because it's a problem for philosophy, but then he changes his mind. Look, maybe it's a problem for philosophers, but it seems like the way of nature because without induction, we could not survive. So I feel positive now. So he recognizes it's a problem for philosophers, but he recognizes that problems for philosophers are problems for philosophers, right? They're not necessarily problems for human survival. Uh, and so his suggestion is that, look, we, we induce. There's no way around it. We just induce. And even though philosophers cannot explain it very well yet, um, we know that it happens. It's necessary for survival. We can't explain why people breathe every single, uh, you know, every uh, few seconds. We can't explain that from a philosophical standpoint. Just because breathing worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. You wouldn't apply that logic for breathing. We're not going to apply that logic for induction. It is the way the mind works, he says. And that seems to be true. Uh, so the other philosophers that we're going to talk about pick up on this idea. Um, Nelson Goodman, a philosopher uh, in the modern era, uh, updated the problem of induction. So he, he agrees. Look, Hume, fine, problem for philosophers, um, not a problem for humans because we do it. But what he was trying to do was to point out there are some limits here and why do we make inductions even when we can? it can be pointed out to us that the inductions could be problematic? Why do we still persist in doing it? So he wants to know why we make certain kind of inductions. And Goodman does what a lot of philosophers do. He creates a thought experiment, a thought experiment that wouldn't happen in reality, wouldn't happen to you personally, but contains premises that you can all we can all agree are possible. Uh, there isn't anything impossible about these. So it illustrates the problem of induction. It's the same problem that Hume identified. So Goodman says, imagine 
for this thought experiment that you are an emerald examiner. You work in an emerald, you work as an emerald examiner and your job is to examine emeralds uh, and kind of picture them being like on a conveyor belt or just you know being handed to you. Here's some emeralds, could you please examine these for me? So you examine the emeralds uh, and you see green emeralds, right? Every time you're examining emeralds, they're green. So you might then form an induction and you would say, you know what? Emeralds are green. I just know they're green because every time I see an emerald, it's green. I've been examining emeralds for the last 20 years. Uh, back when you were still a young, uh, you know, when you were in grade school, I was examining emeralds uh, every single day, green emeralds as far as the eye could see. The Emerald City, it's green because it's made of emeralds. Uh, everything is green, right? However, Goodman points out that at any given moment, there's an alternative generalization, an alternative premise that can be true, and we can agree that it could be true, that makes an entirely opposite prediction about the very next emerald that you are going to examine every time you examine an emerald. And he calls this property GRU. GRU means specifically every emerald you've seen in the last 20 years that has been green, so all emeralds I have ever seen have been green. And everything that I have not seen yet up to this very moment in time is going to be blue. So for the last 20 years, you've been examining green emeralds. And your experience is every time I examine an emerald and I get the next one, it's green. The next one is green. The universe is natural. It's ordered. Emeralds are green. However, at any given moment, you could pick the next one up and it's going to be blue and they're going to be blue for from here on after. Does this mean emeralds change properties? Possibly. Does it mean that you suffered a stroke uh, and suddenly see green as blue? Possibly. It doesn't matter. The point is that as you pick up the next emerald, they're going to be blue from here on in. And his point is that this, we can agree, is true. This property can be true at the same time. It can be true that everything I've seen in the past is green and that at the same time, simultaneously, it's true that everything I've seen is green, but the next one will be blue because you don't know what's coming next. We don't. We don't know what's coming next, right? Uh, there's a little gap between uh, sensation and perception, uh, millisecond gap, so you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Should you have a stroke uh, or a, a neurological abnormality that causes you to perceive what was once green as now blue, that's plausible. It's extremely unlikely, but it's possible. So these can be simultaneously true at any given moment for you. And yet they make opposite predictions. If emeralds are green, the next one is green. If emeralds are blue, the next grew, the next one will be blue, despite all of your evidence to the contrary. And you will be surprised at what happens when you pick up a grew, now blue, emerald, right? So both of these predictions, both of these properties are true of emeralds at every single observation, but they all, but they make opposite predictions. So illustrated, essentially, here is where the event happens, the rupture in the space-time continuum of emeralds and your perception of them. Your past experience is identical. Everyone's past experience is identical in the green universe. Everyone who passes experience is identical if the universe is, if emeralds are grew in that universe. So they're always simultaneously true. However, the future changes. So Goodman's question is how and why do we just ignore the grew possibilities? If I hadn't pointed that out or if he hadn't pointed that out, no one would ever go around thinking that at any given moment now, emeralds are going to shift. Right? And they're going to start turning uh, a different color. And if GRU is only one possibility, right, uh, that presumes there are essentially infinite possibilities of what could happen on that very next emerald observation. Uh, they could be red. They could be furry. Uh, they could start moving. Anything could happen. right? Any of those are possible because the past experience is identical. So now you have an infinite, possibly, a set of possible inferences to draw from, and yet none of us ever assume that these other ones are worth considering. So his question is, why this? Why do we choose this one and not the other one, which has the identical past experience? Why don't we assume that things might change? Even Dan Simons, with his uh, research on 
uh, change blindness and inattention blindness has shown that if the world does change in front of us, remember the guy who switched places while carrying the door, speaking to a different person, sometimes if the world changes right in front of us, we don't even notice. We're so wedded to this that we don't even notice when this might happen. So why do we do that? That's what uh, Goodman is concerned about. He offers some suggestions. Does everybody get the example? This is the risk that most scientific discovery faces. This is the risk of retrospective designs. Uh, we've collected evidence, but maybe we've missed the other evidence. Maybe we've missed the other possibilities. Maybe we haven't done enough uh, to rule out this hypothesis. Just because things worked in the past, as Hume says, why do we expect them to work that way in the future? In other words, in the past, the past predicted the future, but in the future, will the future past predict the future future? We don't know. So Goodman suggests we got some ideas here, and one of them is entrenchment. So he was interested in language. He says that, look, there's a, you know, if things are so reliable, if they're so reliable that we come to expect them, they become part of our linguistic code. They become entrenched in the way we describe our experiences. They become entrenched in the way we use language to explain our experiences and the, to understand the world and to cut nature at the joints. A term has to, in order to be entrenched, a term has to have past history of use. Green is something that we've used in the past to describe all sorts of objects. In fact, remember from our lecture five, uh, it is part of the one of the basic color terms, right? I mean, most, though not all, but most language cultures use a term to describe green type things. Sometimes they even use a green blue type thing. Uh, the, um, the, the group of people from Bolivia who spoke a, a language that didn't determine between green and blue would have been perfectly happy with the grew emeralds, wouldn't have made a difference to them. Um, it's not entrenched. But for most of us, green is entrenched. It means something for things to be green. Gru is not an entrenched term. We simply don't have that. And so Goodman's suggestion is it's not that these things are impossible. It's just that we never consider them because it's not part of our language. It's not part of our culture. And it's not part of the way in which we describe thinking to others. So we don't entrench these uh, conflicts. We do use green as a term to describe groups of objects. Um, W.V.O. Quine, the last philosopher we'll talk about today, um, picked up on this idea as well and suggested that in addition to linguistic entrenchment, we also rely on natural kinds. In other words, natural groupings inform our inductions. Green emeralds form a kind they form a concept, they form a group of things because of similarity. In other words, because they have this culturally entrenched color term, green, uh, they all look green. And it's actually a property that we associate with emeralds, right? Green emeralds. Although emeralds could be grew as well, uh, it's not entrenched. And it also doesn't put them together in a group. Uh, if it turned out that 20 years of emeralds examination gave you a lot of greens and then they suddenly turned blue, you would just update your beliefs about emeralds, right? They would be blue or green. Uh, and you might have a subcategory of green emeralds and a subcategory of blue emeralds. You wouldn't have grew emeralds. You still wouldn't have grew, even if grew were true. You would just have two different kinds of emeralds. They would be things that exist uh, with other colors. So it is not a natural kind. There is no similarity uh, matrix. We wouldn't see all of the universe's emeralds together uh, and include that time point that is required for GRU to work. So Hume points out the problem. Goodman then suggests an updated version of the problem and a, a reason for why we make the inductions that we do. Uh, and Quine suggests we rely on natural kinds. In other words, if induction is gonna work, it's gonna be based around our categories, not just memory, but categories and concepts. So we've organized our memory into concepts. We've organized our memories into categories. We've organized memory into schemas. Uh, we can use those things to then infer properties and to make inductions. I mean, all, and we've suggested in the concepts and categories lecture, all animals, all organisms can make, uh, can use similarity, whether they're primitive features or theoretical similarity. 
anything that holds things together. Uh, all organisms can do this. Uh, whatever their sensory uh, capabilities are, they can rely on sensory capabilities to group things together into behavioral equivalence classes. Green emeralds are a behavioral equivalence class, a, a natural kind. Brew emeralds are not a behavioral equivalence class. So from here on in, I want to talk about categorical induction. Uh, we'll talk about the idea of categorical induction, and then we'll talk about some examples of inductive reasoning that suggest people rely on different aspects of categories, similarity, uh, the degree of coverage, uh, and also the coherence of categories can inform the kinds of inductions we make. Uh, we defined categories and concepts as a behavioral equivalence class, and this is a perfect example of a behavioral equivalence class. Uh, if we've decided things belong to a category, we make the same kind of predictions about them. We make the same kind of inferences about them. So we're going to talk about generalization and similarity. We assume that concepts are organized by similarity. That was one of the cornerstones of any of the theories we talked about, right? Uh, we suggested that uh, objects could be bound together by exemplar similarity, by prototype similarity, by family resemblance uh, similarity, structural similarity, different levels of hierarchical organization with between and within category similarity. So all of these concepts are being bound together by similarity, and we make predictions based on conceptual similarity. Categorical induction is the idea of how you might arrive how people arrive at a statement of confidence that a conclusion category has a feature or a predicate after being told that one or more premise categories have it. This is a very formal way of saying, now that you know that the Hubbard squash is a winter squash, will it have stringy fibers in between? That's an example of a categorical inference. You are told something belongs to a category, you take what you know about the category and you then predict something about a feature that you haven't experienced yet. And you make that prediction not on your direct experience. If you've never seen a Hubbard squash, you do not know what's gonna be inside there. All you know is what's inside the category of winter squashes, and that's what you're relying on. So in order to do this experimentally, uh, we might use something what's known as a blank predicate, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But here's an example. Uh, boys use GABA as a neurotransmitter in their brains. So young adult, uh, young, young adult or juvenile male human beings, boys have brains that use GABA as a neurotransmitter. How many people know exactly what GABA does if you're in the neuroscience program? Okay, so maybe a few of you know what GABA does. How many people know it might be a neurotransmitter but don't know what it does? And now you do know it's a neurotransmitter because we've just said, uh, boys use GABA as a neurotransmitter. Therefore, girls use GABA as a neurotransmitter based on what you know about the difference between biological male and female human brains, you would assume the neurotransmitter use is gonna be equivalent, right? That's what we would assume. Uh, we know that boys, brains, girls' brains are members of the same category, young human brains, and that they use the same chemicals and that they have the same structure. Uh, so if we're told that one member of the category, boys, use this particular chemical as a neurotransmitter, how likely is it that girls would also use the same chemical? Most of us would say it's very likely. <laughs> Uh, they're members of the same category. We know that boys and girls are both uh, juvenile human beings with a brain structure that uses the same neurotransmitters. I don't know what GABA does, you might say to yourself. Uh, I don't know the differences between boy and girl brains, male and female brains, uh, or human and adult brains for that matter. But I do know that uh, the chemicals tend to be the same. And if you tell me that boys use this as a neurotransmitter, I believe you with that conclusion. That's a categorical induction. You don't need to know what girls' neurotransmitter uh, makeup is like, but you do have some factual evidence here. You accept this premise and you then 
uh, project the features or the conclusions uh, to the next category. In this case, we're going to refer to that as a blank predicate. And we'll see another one in the next few examples, sesamoid bones. So most of these examples ask people to make conclusions about something they don't know. GABA is a neurotransmitter, a specific kind of bones. Why is it crucial to use this when you're asking people to make categorical induction uh, decisions? Well, it's crucial because you don't want people to, in these experiments, retrieving a fact from memory is not an induction. Retrieving a fact from memory is retrieving a fact from memory. Uh, using what you know about a category to infer something you do not know in other words, to discover something new by thinking, that is a categorical induction. So in order to set up a categorical induction statement, you want people to rely on the category. You don't want them to rely on already knowing the answer. If you already know what kinds of neurotransmitters uh, boys and girls' brains use, then you're not really making an inference. You're just relating a fact that you're aware of. And maybe some people are aware of that fact. So what you'll see in most of these examples is a particular feature that is plausible, that is likely, but we're gonna determine how likely it is based on category membership. That's why it's crucial. Why is this slide crucial? There's almost always a question on the final exam about what is a blank predicate and why is it crucial? So I stuck this in as a slide to remind people that this could be a possible short answer question. However, as you probably know from prior experience, sometimes I mention things that might show up on the exam and they do show up on the exam. Sometimes I mention things that might show up in the exam and they don't always show up, but usually there's a fairly strong correlation. So this question has shown up in the past and using my past uh, predictions, uh, I suspect it could show up in the future. So if we're gonna talk about categorical induction, the obvious place to go is similarity. And there's with the thunder again. You know, I brought an umbrella with me to campus and left it in my office, uh, which was unwise, given that I knew it was going to rain in the middle part of the day. Um, so if we're going to start with categorical induction, let's start with similarity, because that's one of the things that's the most salient about concepts and categories, right? Things in a concept or a category are similar to each other. Um, we're going to call this similarity-based induction. Arguments are strong to the extent that categories in the premise are similar. So if we were to ask which one of these arguments, which one of these inductive arguments is stronger, which one is the better induction? Number one, I seem to have covered over the head of the robin over here. Let me just move me out of the way a little bit. There he is. Robins over here have sesamoid bones. Anybody know what a sesamoid bone is? It's a kind of bone, apparently. Um, so that's all we need to know. We know that robins have bones. They don't have any other mechanism of supporting their body. So we know they have bones, and now we're telling you they have a specific kind of bone. Uh, they have a sesamoid bone. Therefore, sparrows, sparrow over here, also have sesamoid bones. That is one kind of inductive inference. We know a fact about robins. How much do you believe that same fact about sparrows? Option number two. Ostriches have sesamoid bones. There's an ostrich right there. Therefore, sparrows have sesamoid bones. Uh, also a possibility. Which of these two inductions seems like a better bet? If you were going to place money on one of these being more true, which one seems like the better induction? Anybody hazard a guess here? I, I feel like robins and sparrows. Is a, how many people would agree robins and sparrows? I feel very strongly about that one. Um, so yes, that's why. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why. What's, let's look at the reasons why that might be the case. It turns out that when people are asked uh, which of these two are stronger, most participants, almost everyone agrees that robins to sparrows is a better argument. If you're gonna convince somebody something about uh, sesamoid bones, give them the robin evidence, don't give them the ostrich evidence. So what are the problems with this? What, what are the advantages of the first and what are the problems with the second? Why would people make this distinction? Well, one possibility is that these guys look similar. I mean, these two birds look similar. We all know the differences between robins and sparrows. Even if we don't know the specific uh, um, bird, we can tell what, you know, we can tell that they're similar to each other. They're backyard birds, right? 
we all know that the ostrich is an outlier in the bird category, right? The largest bird, it's flightless. I mean, you can see the similarity. You can see that there are some features there. There's some feathers and a bird face and a beak and everything, but there's a lot of difference there. And if you find out some features about uh, a robin, given that robins are kind of the prototype for most of us, for a lot of our experience with birds, look, if they're a prototype, that means they already share features with lots of other birds. And in fact, these birds will look alike. Well, if they look alike, then they probably have some internal physiology that's similar to. So we're, we find that to be a compelling argument. It's a similarity-based argument. Robins are similar to most other birds. They're similar to sparrows. Sparrows are similar to lots of other birds. If they're similar in lots of other seen ways, they're probably similar in unseen ways. Ostriches are not similar to other birds. They are larger than other birds. They are flightless. Uh, they run fast. They have eggs the size of a uh, football. Um, lots of things unique. And if you were then told there's something internal, physiological, unique about them, these sesamoid bones, you might think, well, okay, everything else is weird about ostriches. Probably the bones are too. I'm less likely to think that sparrows would share that. Uh, with ostriches. And that's a perfect example of a similarity-based induction. Once we know that those categories are similar, uh, we can draw on that understanding of similarity to make the prediction. The other aspect is of categorical induction is called coverage. And we can refer to this as typicality. So these things are related. In the theory that I'm going to discuss in just a minute, it's called the similarity coverage model. But coverage overlaps with what we've talked about already as typicality. Remember, typicality is the idea that some exemplars in a category are so central that they share features with everything else. They are typical. Robins are typical birds. So which argument is stronger? Uh, robins have sesamoid bones, therefore all birds have sesamoid bones, or penguins have sesamoid bones, therefore all birds have sesamoid bones. Most people would be happy uh, with the first one and not the second. Uh, the second one strikes people as less good. Penguins, they're just not typical. They are atypical. Anything true of penguins is less likely to be true of other birds because they're kind of on the outlier. They swim, uh, they don't fly, they stand up uh, and look like little, little people. Uh, they sort of waddle around. and Everything about them is sort of unusual for birds. And so finding out that they have a particular kind of bone structure, uh, you would be less likely to say that, well, every other bird must have that. But if you find out a feature about robins, you feel a little more confident about assuming that everything else in the bird category has. That's because robins are typical. They cover more of the bird category. Robin is typical and it covers the category. And what researchers have discovered is that we use both of these things in conjunction in order to make uh, inferences. And they refer to this, Daniel Osherson and colleagues refer to this as the similarity coverage model. The similarity coverage model assumes that we use similarity to make inductions and we use coverage. Sometimes those things are in concert with each other. Occasionally they conflict with each other and they can lead to some very specific uh, conclusions. Induction is guided by the similarity of the premise category, that's the robin in the first example, to the conclusion cap category. So robin and sparrow are more similar than robin and ostrich. So the degree to which the thing that you know about is similar to the thing that you don't know about, the stronger that similarity, the better your inference is gonna be, the more likely you are to draw an inference. Does that make sense? So it's a stronger argument. It's just more likely to be true. If it's happened in the past, uh, it should happen in the future. If it happens to all of these examples, it should happen to things that you're less familiar with. So that's one. It's guided by the similarity of the premise to the conclusion. It's also guided by the degree of coverage that the premise exemplar, the robin in this case, has over the category that includes everything. So if you're talking about the category of birds, the degree to which robin covers a lot of examples uh, suggests that your inferences and your inductions are more likely to be accurate. So there are two things working here, similarity between premise and conclusion, and the coverage or the typicality of the premise to the category that includes everything. 
If Robin is typical of all birds, then concluding something about either all birds or a specific bird is going to be a stronger conclusion. Robin covers more of the bird category than penguin. So I want to go through a few of these examples. Time-wise, we're looking okay. It's only 11.29. It's going to seem, is it going to seem better or worse next week when we change? Do we actually go back to daylight saving time next week? Is that, is that, is that true? Does it really happen on March 9th? I think it happens next week. I think we change the clocks to go forward so that it will seem earlier next week. I feel like that's too early in the season, but, or is it two weeks from now? Oh, thank those. That's still too early, but it's not as bad as it was. Okay. Anyway, it's only 1130. Uh, we've got a little bit more time to go. So the diversity effect, I like the diversity effect because the diversity effect is one that illustrates the role that coverage plays. Uh, and it illustrates the degree to which this idea of superordinate categories, the category that includes all of the exemplars and uh, objects we're talking about. So Oshersen asks uh, subjects, um, so diversity says the less similar two premises are to each other, sometimes the stronger the argument will be. So coverage and typicality sometimes uh, suggests that similarity among things is less important. In fact, we want to actually have a lot of diversity. Which argument is stronger? Hippos, hippopotamuses, or hippopotami, I don't really know which one it is. I'm going to say hippopotamuses. Uh, and hamsters, so the hippopotamus is very large, hamster very small, both love onions. And therefore, we're going to ask you to say all mammals love onions. Ignore the fact that you may not love onions. That's an entirely separate thing, or your cat may not love onions. Let's just say, for sake of argument, we now know hippos love them, hamsters love them. That's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that hippos and rhinos, the hippopotamus, large, the rhinoceros, also large. In fact, what's the difference between the two of them? I guess the one has the horns on the front, right? But otherwise, for all intents and purposes, if you're like me, you probably kind of group them together as kind of the same thing, right? They're both large, huge land mammals uh, that seem like they might be aggressive, maybe not, I don't know. Um, and maybe they love onions. And then we're gonna conclude that all mammals love onions. Which of these two arguments seems better? Anybody give me a guess. Which of them is gonna give you better evidence for concluding that all mammals love onions? Hippos and rhinos or hippos and hamsters? Hamsters? Hippos and hamsters, and why is that? They're different. I feel like they're more different than hippos and rhinos, so it might cover more. They are so different and they cover more, exactly. So uh, our hippos and hampers, the diversity example has greater coverage. Most people in the experiment would prefer this. Uh, and it makes, as you suggested, it makes sense. Um, if we've said, look, everything from the largest land mammal, the hippopotamus, to the inconsequential uh, hamster, which I don't know what they're about this big, right? They're not very large. Uh, if everything from those, from that range loves onions, well, then it's possible that lots of things love onions, lots of, or maybe all mammals love onions. But if you find out that these two very similar animals that you've probably only experienced in a zoo, uh, or something like that. If they both love onions, well, maybe they're the only thing that love onions. You know, I'm not going to assume that a hamster would also love an onion if I just find out that these two large land mammals do. So the diversity example gives you a lot more evidence. You've covered a lot of the category. And if you put in three or four more different exemplars, if you said hippos, hamsters, cats, uh, and uh, and dogs, all love onions and primates love onions. Well, and you keep adding more stuff, it's gonna seem like a stronger example. You add more things, they're very diverse to each other. Now you've just covered everything. So that's the diversity effect in action. Let's talk about a few other examples. This also makes the prediction that there are some limits to diversity. And I'll talk about the next two with being sort of limits to diversity. Um, if you add something from a different category, it can undermine uh, this diversity effect. So a premise category that has little overlap 
with the conclusion category should have no effect on argument strength, even if it leads to a more diverse set of uh, premises. So we were fine to conclude something about hippos, hamsters, and all mammals loving onions because they were all under that all mammals uh, category. However, it doesn't work when we're making some specific predictions. If we find out that German shepherds and giraffes have sesamoid bones, therefore moles have sesamoid bones, three very different kinds of animals, by the way, uh, and German shepherds and whales, also mammals, uh, but moles have sesamoid bones, which of these two premises seems like it would allow for a more confident conclusion? Um, most uh, subjects in the experiment pick the first as the stronger option. And the reason is that the diversity effect is kind of reversed or undermined or it doesn't hold. The whales are just, although they're also mammals, they're too far outside. Uh, they're not similar enough to moles. Not that giraffes and German shepherds are, but whales are more dissimilar. So diversity doesn't help here. There's very little feature overlap between dogs and whales and moles. It's really nothing to hold them together. Now, if the example was dogs, whales, moles love onions, therefore all mammals love onions, we might find the diversity effect working because it covers that category. In this case, there's very little feature overlap, so it kind of reverses the diversity effect. So this is a limit to diversity, a limit to coverage. Uh, another one that shows up is the idea of monotonicity. Monotonicity is what we've already been discussing when you provide more evidence. Uh, the more features, or the more examples you give, especially in a diversity effect, but also in a similarity uh, argument, the more of these examples you give, the better the argument is. Anytime you're having a discussion with someone, you want to convince them of something, you probably provide more evidence, right? You keep providing examples. If you give more evidence to somebody, uh, they are more likely to accept your conclusion. And the same thing holds true for inductive inferences. Um, so that suggests that the strength of the induction increases monotonically. In other words, more premises leads to more endorsement. You add one more, you add two more, you add three more, it increases monotonically. The number of premise category, premise exemplars you add, the stronger the argument gets, unless a dissimilar premise is included. So if a premise is included that undermines, uh, it can include a non, it, it results in a non-monotonic increase in conclusion strength. So crows and peacocks and robins all having a strong sternum, I assume they do, uh, therefore all birds have a strong sternum, um, is going to be stronger than crows and peacocks alone because you provided more evidence. This is the monot monotonicity. This gives you one more piece of evidence. Crows and peacocks and all birds is fine. Crows, peacocks, and robins even better because more uh, similarity there. However, if you've got crows and peacocks and rabbits, uh, now you've got one that's very dissimilar. And most participants would find that to be an unsatisfactory conclusion. There's something wrong about the premises uh, and activates too many uh, different categories. It's not appropriate for making conclusions about all birds. Last one I wanna talk about before we get to the idea of category coherence, and that's the inclusion fallacy. Sorry, I have two more to talk about. I wanna talk about causal links after this and then category coherence. Without a doubt, this is perhaps maybe the most grueling part of this particular lecture is going through all of these induction effects uh, because do you find that they sometimes, they get a little confusing after a while for me. Uh, so we wanna, I wanna make sure we pause after each one. Is everybody okay uh, with the understanding of these? Let's keep going. Um, the inclusion fallacy, this one is worth remembering because it's a good one to ask a question about. Um, it's good to ask questions about all of these. This is a particularly good one because it suggests people making an error. Psychologists who study thinking and reasoning love pointing out mistakes in people's thinking. This is a mistake in people's thinking. Anytime there's a fallacy or a cognitive error or a bias, psychologists love that kind of stuff because it gives us insights into how the mind actually works when we can see these errors made. Uh, here's an error. Uh, 
Participants are asked, which is the stronger argument? All robins have sesamoid bones, therefore all birds have sesamoid bones. That's argument number one, all robins, all birds. Argument number two, all robins, therefore all ostriches have sesamoid bones. Of these two, which would be the stronger argument? How many are feeling argument number one based on what we've just talked about as being a stronger argument? All robins, therefore all, all birds. This would kind of make sense if you were thinking about the robins occupying a typical uh, space in the category. How many people like option number two? All birds, all um, robins, therefore all ostriches uh, have this. If you like option number two, why do you like option number two? It's more likely for two birds to be related than one bird with all birds. Absolutely, it's more likely uh, because all birds includes robins. So if we're comfortable here, we have to be at least as comfortable, if not more comfortable, because as you suggested, the probability of two birds being uh, sharing a feature is greater than all birds sharing a feature not unlike the conjunction fallacy we discussed earlier. But at the very least, you have to agree. All birds includes all ostriches. This can't be stronger than this one. At the very least, they would have to be equal, right? Uh, and probabilistically, this would be a stronger argument. However, when Osherson and colleagues asked participants to evaluate statements like this, most participants, the majority of their participants preferred the first argument. And you can see why robins are central. They are typical. They cover a lot of things. Ostriches, not so much. The introduction of ostriches throws people off. It's a fallacy. And what they found or what they determined is that people use similarity relations rather than category inclusion. This seems to undermine the similarity coverage model. And it suggests that people are not only aware of overall categories, they're also aware of individual features. The fact that robins and ostriches share few features reduces the likelihood of that particular inference. Even though, logically, it should be preferred, most participants in the experiment prefer the other one, uh, suggesting they're paying attention to features and not just category membership a possible limitation uh, to, the to the similarity coverage model. Two other things that fall outside of the similarity coverage model, I wanna talk about causality uh, again, um, and then we'll talk about coherence, and then we should reach the end of today's lecture. Um, causal links. So although we've discussed the relationship between uh, similarity, between uh, premise and conclusions, and coverage and typicality, there are other forces at play in the universe, right? Not everything is just about categories and not everything is just about similarity. There are causal relationships uh, that might be at play. Sometimes things that don't look alike go together because one causes the other one to happen. Here's an example, cats. Let's suppose house cats, like my cat. Peppermint is her name, by the way, uh, and because she's 16, she's set in her ways. And how many of you have a cat or have had a cat? They are the worst in the middle of the night. Uh, and the longer you exist with a cat, the more the relationship between the cause and effect uh, gets completely out of hand. So that if you start waking up in the middle of the night to deal with the cat making some noise, they expect it. They then cause you to wake up. And then of course I have to wake up anyway because maybe I've got to go to the bathroom or something. And so this whole cause and effect, neither one of us are similar, right? Our thought patterns are not similar. Our behaviors in the middle of the night are not similar. However, we have similar night patterns because of a causal relationship. The cat does one thing and causes me to do the other thing. She, I assume, thinks that I'm causing her to do something. She's causing me to do something. There's a causal relationship there. So let's think about cats. Suppose the poor cat has a parasite. It's called parasite X. Cats have parasites, right? They can, uh, anybody can have a parasite. Any organism can have a parasite. I feel like my cat is sometimes a parasite. So cats have a parasite. You also find out that field mice have a parasite. Therefore, all mammals have a parasite. 
That's one possibility. Um, and that seems very much like the coverage example, right? Because cats and mice, they're not the same animal. They cover a fairly broad range, certainly more so than cats and tigers, which are the same species, right? Uh, so big, basically big cats and small cats have the parasite, therefore all mammals have the parasite. Uh, given what you know about the similarity coverage model, and given what you know about causal links, which of these seems like the better argument? Which of these is more likely to be true about all mammals? Example number one or example number two? Now, I think you could make a strong case for either one of them, couldn't you? I could make a strong case for either one of them. Um, however, people prefer the second argument. And the reason people often prefer the second argument, um, whoops, is that the first one highlight, although the first one has a diversity effect, should, should prompt a diversity effect, often we think about the causal link. Cats and tigers, they're the same kind of mammal. This should not prompt very much, uh, very strong conclusions about all mammals. However, cats and mice not being the same kind of mammal, there could be an alternative explanation. Maybe the cats get the parasite from chasing the mice, right? Or vice versa or something like that. There's a, there's a relationship between those two organisms that is kind of unique to those two organisms, cats chasing mice. Uh, and so we're not likely to project that property to all mammals. Maybe it's just a cat and mouse thing, right? Maybe there's just something about cats and mice sharing this parasite through interactions as a causal link. And so that undermines a possible diversity effect. And most people are sensitive to this causality, knowing that this is a possible causal link and that there's no causal link here between cats and tigers. We feel like it's a better argument about all mammals. Another example of causality, uh, we can call this causal asymmetry. Sometimes the way in which an argument is structured can highlight a causal direction. And if you can highlight a causal link, most people will uh, latch on to that causal link and it will undermine categorical induction. Uh, so this is a study from Doug Medine. Switching premise and conclusion categories will reduce the strength of an argument if there is a causal path. So if you're given a, an example like gazelles, which are sort of large uh, kind of deer-like animals, right, that live on savannas, contain a chemical called retinum, and lions also contain retinum, most people will assume this is a stronger conclusion uh, than lions containing it versus gazelles containing it. Why would the first one be stronger? It's the same premise, same conclusion. The reason people prefer the first is that it's in the direction of causality. The assumption is uh, that lions would obtain this nutrient from the gazelles that they hunt. It's not said explicitly, but ordering them in this way suggests the link between them. Gazelles have a nutrient. Lions obtain the nutrient from eating the gazelles as their prey. When they're reversed, that causal link uh, isn't highlighted. And so the argument seems less strong. Does that seem clear? So we use categories and categorical inclusion to make inferences. We also use features to make uh, conclusions, and we use causal links to make conclusions. One final example, and then we should wrap things up, and that has to do with coherence. Uh, so if we're using categories, whether the categories are featurely based or inclusive based, uh, some categories are really coherent. Uh, some categories hold together really well. The category of lions, for example, or hippopotamuses holds together really well. All hippopotamuses pretty much look the same right? It's a coherent category. They are hippopotamuses. They look like a hippopotamus. They act like a hippopotamus. Very coherent category. However, social categories, occupational categories, some of them are more coherent. And we kind of saw that back uh, in the Kahneman and Tversky examples. Feminist supporter, kind of coherent, right? We kind of imagine the kinds of properties that someone who is a feminist supporter or an accountant might have. Bank teller, eh, maybe not so much. Maybe there's lots of things that a bank teller might have. So maybe it's a less coherent category. 
Some research has looked at that tendency uh, to make inferences and predictions and has generally concluded that the more coherent the category, the stronger the inference that we draw. So inductions are made from concepts and categories based on the similarity of the premise. So we already know this. Police officer, for example, we might assume is a coherent category. Why is it a coherent category? Well, we might assume that people go into law enforcement have similar goals. We might assume that they're a similar age and demographic. They go through a similar kind of training. Uh, their jobs are similar. So we might assume that police officer is a fairly coherent category. They wear uniforms, they look alike. Uh, there are lots of things about being a police officer su that suggest coherence. And that might be one of the reasons why we are likely to draw inferences about uh, individual police officers. We expect there to be, to be a high degree of similarity. Upon hearing that someone is a police officer, we might feel confident in our predictions. And we've already talked about some examples for why this might be. Someone who is a server in a restaurant, unless it's a very specific kind of restaurant, maybe you have less uh, of an ability to predict something about that person because uh, maybe there's a greater variability of individuals who go into serving a re uh, in a restaurant, uh, different kinds of restaurant, different ages, uh, the kind of training might be different. Sure, they carry out some of the same behaviors, but as a person, uh, there might be we might expect more variability. So this might be a less coherent category compared to police officer. There's probably more diversity in this category, different kinds of people. So uh, some research uh, by um, Brian Ross uh, and colleagues uh, in the 2000s kind of looked at social occupational categories and our tendency to draw conclusions on. Them. And as I said, what they found is that the more tightly coherent, or the more tightly uh, bound the category is, the stronger the inference. Here's how they tested this. Uh, they pre-tested some categories that have a high degree of entitativity. Uh, that's a longer word way of saying that the category has an essence. There's something about soldier, feminist supporter, and minister that kind of suggests you know, a real reason that you'd want to belong to that category. Uh, maybe a lot of training that makes people seem the same in that category. So a soldier or person in the armed forces, maybe there's some uniformity there by design. Uh, people who go into supporting a cause, they have certain sets of beliefs. Uh, people who might become a minister or a priest might have certain callings or certain set of beliefs. So there might be some coherence to those categories that you don't find in someone who is a matchbook collector. That is a group of people, but who knows what kind of person collects matchbooks or county clerk. Uh, should be county clerk, not country clerk. Sorry for that uh, typo. Or a limousine driver, low in coherence. So Yes, someone who drives a limousine is a limousine driver. That's the thing that they have in common. Other than that, I don't know what else they might have in common. Uh, so there are some reasons to suspect that some of these are more coherent than others. Uh, and then they gave them questions like um, an induction task in which people were asked to make predictions about people who are members of more than one category. For example, 80% of feminist supporters prefer Coke to Pepsi. Feminists love Coke. Uh, these are not true. These are just made up. 80% uh, of waiters prefer, prefer Pepsi to Coke. Chris is a feminist supporter and a waiter. Which beverage does Chris prefer? So we tell you something about feminists, we tell supporters, we tell you something about uh, restaurant waiters. Uh, they have equal likelihood of preferring one to the other. And then we tell you about a person who belongs to both categories which of these categories is going to inform your judgment? Uh, and what they found is that people, um, people tended to prefer the coherent categories. If you're forced to make a choice, we assume that Chris is more likely to be a Coke drinker because of these two, the feminist waiter is likely to identify uh, more strongly with the things that other feminists have in common. It's kind of the same idea, this representativeness idea that under that was underlying uh, the um, Kahneman and Tversky example, except now we're talking about the coherence of the category itself, not just what you think about feminist supporters, ministers, police officers, and matchbook collectors, but rather 
the structural coherence of the category itself. Uh, Chris is more likely to prefer Coke because people view feminist supporter as the more coherent category. Uh, and you prefer to base your in inductions on categories that have some coherence to them. Okay, that's all we've got for today. We're finishing up just a little before 12 o'clock. That is perfect. That's exactly where I would like to finish uh, every single class uh, at 12 o'clock. So before you go, let me leave you with some uh, things. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about deductive logic and causal reasoning. We've already introduced the ideas. Uh, so we'll have more to say about causality uh, and I'll have more to say about deduction. Uh, and then we have quiz three online, which will cover induction, deduction, and causal reasoning. All right, enjoy the rest of the week, the ups and downs in, in the weather. Uh, and I'll see everybody on Tuesday, March 5th. Bye.